Okay, proofs of custody. So just to give a little bit of context, proofs of custody are this um, quite neat um, cryptoeconomic uh, construction. Um, and the way they fit in the context of sharding is basically to do what I call enhanced voting. So sharding, or part of sharding is about um, scaling up the data availability problem. So not everyone downloads every piece of data. And one of the main techniques that we have is to basically sample validators at random from a pool, and then we have an honesty assumption um, at the pool level, um, which uh, gives us um, some assumption in terms of the committees. Um, but it'd be nice if we could um, go beyond just honesty and we could start um, using uh, rationality, so financial incentives, uh, to make sure that people vote properly. In particular, when they vote on the availability of data, it would be nice if um, we could have some high level of confidence that they actually have the data that they're voting on. And if they have the data, at the very least, it's available for them, so that's really good. So if you have a committee of 1,000 and your threshold is 500, then if you have 500 votes, then you know, 500 people in the network have this data, so that's, that's pretty good. Um, I guess we could start going into details of the construction. Um, so the, the setup is that you have a secret which um, is unique to you as a validator. And you need to keep it secret, otherwise if it leaks, there will be a slashing condition which will uh, allow um, whoever uh, reveals the secret to, to take half, half your deposit and to slash the other half. And on chain, you have a commitment for that uh, secret. And that commitment is uh, fairly long lived. It could be something like a week or 30 days. It doesn't have to be recycled very often. And then the question is given a, a, a piece of data that the validator is meant to have, um, and by the way, that piece of data is identified um, by its Merkle root. So instead of just. Um, taking the data and identifying it with, with its hash, um, which, for example, is what uh, Bitcoin does, uh, we have um, the, the data be a, a, a power of two. So it means that you can uh, very nicely uh, merkleize it, where each leaf is a, a chunk, what we call a chunk, which is 32 bytes. So this uh, Merkle root is what identifies the data. And you want to come up with a scheme where um, you, you prove that you have custody of the data. And just in, in, in a couple of sentences, what you do is that um, you take your, your, your data D, that, for which you want to prove custody, and you split it up into, into 32 byte chunks. And then for every single chunk, you mix in your secret. And, and, and then you merkleize that. And you get another root, uh, R tilde, um, which is basically a route that you and only you should be able to compute. And you should only be able to compute it if you have the data. So um, one of the things we, we, wa we want to prevent, for example, is um, uh, being able to outsource the computation uh, of this thing to other people. But because of the secret part, um, and because of the fact that the secret is mixed in at at every uh, single piece of data, you can't, um, and because you can't give away that secret to, to a third party without risking uh, having your deposit slashed, uh, it means that only you can make this computation. And furthermore, um, obviously you need the data to, 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 to be able to do this computation, so, so you'll have the data. Um, so one of the, um, just to, to give a bit more context even, one of the reasons why it's nice to have this, uh, this proof of custody scheme is, is also to prevent what's called copycat voting. So um, if you're a lazy validator and you don't have much bandwidth to verify the availability of blocks, then one perfectly um, rational strategy would be to um, wait some period of time and see what other people are voting on and then if many people are saying, oh, this, this data is available, then um, 
you know, you also say that it's available, but um, I guess the point of the scheme is that um, you're not a, you, you, you can't do that. You can't be lazy. You actually have to download the data and produce this thing. Now, um, um, any, any questions so far as to uh, why this scheme kind of um, proves that that um, that with, you would have the data. So one, one thing that sorry, I forget to mention, which is very important, is that after the, the 30 days or seven days, you reveal your secret. So once you've revealed your secret, then everyone else can verify the, um, the root, uh, the proof of custody that uh, you've submitted. And if it turns out that it's wrong, then you can start engaging in a, in a challenge game. Um, so something similar to TrueBit. So the challenger will have, they'll have the, the secret, which is no longer a secret, it's a, it's a public, and they'll be able to uh, compute, uh, compute the route, and if it doesn't match, engage in the game. And then we can go into the details of the game, it's, it's quite easy, um, but that, that's how it works at a high level. You just threw out 30 days, approximately. What, what kind of timescales would make sense to have the cycle on? And why, where does that come from? Right, so you, 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 you like to be able to reuse the secret just for, for efficiency, but on the other hand, you don't want to use it for too long a period. And the reason is that um, the, the proof of custody becomes verifiable only after you've revealed your secret. Which means that um, if you start cheating, then you might as well cheat as, mo as much as you can uh, and basically cheat during the whole 30-day period. So um, you know, we, wa we want to limit the, the period during which uh, bad things can happen if they do happen. Why not just use some sort of public key scheme to produce the the secret per per tree or whatever or per day or something like that, so that you I mean wouldn't that be so then you it um, number like number one that's like as far as security goes like hashes are pretty much the gold stand the, the gold standard and you have the most guarantee you'll never have to change it again um, number two you get much more efficiency. Um, because number three, like actually the fact that we're using XOR to mix in the data basically means that you can use the um, branch challenging scheme also like as a way of actually recovering particular pieces of data because if you have the seed then you can uh, be, uh, get the data right back. So like basically between those three there's not really, like, this, this is pretty much the most efficient. Yeah. How do you mix it in? Um, XOR. But then if anyone has a piece of the, the data, that chunk, they can XOR it with? With the original data and recover your key, yes. But the point is that the challenge period only starts like basically so after does, it comes time to, or rather you can only, like your the challenge only, period end when the proof is provided? Uh, no, the challenge period keeps going for a while, but the point is but that... But as soon as the proof is provided, you have a leaf. Yeah, so as, as soon as the proof is provided, the secret is going to be known regardless, right? So, yeah. now granted, if you use public key cryptography, it's not, but in this case, it is, but like, that's fine. And so isn't the challenge period the period to, to reveal the secret? No, the period to reveal the secret is before the challenge period. Okay, so and the period to reveal the secret ends when? Um, it withdrawal delay. Or rather, no, so here's how it works, right? So basically... If, so there, there, is some, uh, there is some point in time at which you basically have to reveal a secret, and you could re then, as soon as you reveal a secret, then the clock starts ticking, and well, basically, if you get challenged during that time, then you have to respond to those challenges. But as soon as you provide a branch, your secret is revealed? No, correct, but the point so is you that you're only the going to be revealed. No, yes, you reveal a secret before providing any branches. Okay.
Yeah, I mean, I guess the main thing that I didn't understand is so, um, so if you're, the, the, the challenge period doesn't start for quite a long time, actually. Mm -hmm. And it seems like that, that makes me nervous. We could, uh, who knows what the threat model is, but um, if you wanted a challenge period to be able to start almost immediately, mm -hmm. then you could, you know, say do a Diffie-Hellman to derive the secret Mm -hmm. And then, or whatever, and then you could, and then, and then, you know, if the guy needs to reveal the secret for this particular tree, then he can do so. And so that way your challenge period can start right away, which I, I don't know the, the full threat. The other model here. thing that you can do is you can say, so like, first of all, there's going to be a lot of, like, there's two reasons why you might want to start a challenge, right? One of them is that you disagree with the commitment. And the second is that you think the data is unavailable. So for the, we, what we can do is we can try to, like the first use case, we can only target it after the seed is revealed. For the second use case, we can allow challenges to happen immediately. And if a challenge does happen immediately, you can yes. have a rule that says that you pretty much have to submit the secret or respond to that challenge before you're allowed to do anything else. Uh, okay, so yeah, that's, I, now I see that it's actually in the threat model that you can, it's because you can just yeah. make the data available or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. But, but even there, you, you have, kind of have to commit reveal. So somehow, like, how do you reveal your secret before a front runner does it and take your deposit, right? Well, because only you have your, oh, I see. So like, how do you publish the secret? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you need to do like okay, an additional Okay, so one answer reveal. is that the uh, game for, the, the place where you can be uh, penalized for revealing your secret, like basically ends like one dime. Like you wait for the, for the end of that period to finalize before you reveal the secret. Um, but you, you said that someone could publish a challenge right away. Oh, no, I see. So basically, the, the idea would be that if someone uh, publishes a challenge right away, then you wait until that finalizes, and then you publish your secret. So if you can't respond, you can't actually respond to the challenge right away. You have to wait. For, for one dynasty. At okay. Least, you, so, there, so this might so be there, optimized. So there are delays no matter, no matter what in this game. Right, yeah. There's Although, two no. things they're trying to enforce. Mm -hmm. One of them is that the data is available and that they need to make sure is happen, happen, they need to be able to verify that quickly. And the second one that nobody submits false challenges, they can just sort that out later and that's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But like, do we want to know that the data is available now? Well, the point of this scheme isn't to say that the data is available now. It's to say that either the data is available now or a whole bunch of people are putting their money at risk. Right, like it's deliberately kind of like cryptoeconomic in that sense. I mean, it's not clear that they're putting their money at risk if they, ha if they actually have the data. Right, like if they actually have the data and they're not, yeah. So like this does not guarantee that for like, so it, this does not provide disincentives in the case where a malicious person created the data behind a proposal, published the, uh, proposal, the proposal header without the data, but does have all of, the, um, all of the data themselves and is willing to only give out specific branches in response to challenges. If you want a technology that does survive my, that, um, that threat model, then you can look at my erasure code data availability checking stuff. Sure. So another question, um, why did you change, the, so why not use digital signatures instead of XORing with ES? Um, so as I mentioned, right, number one, it does create the property that you can basically, from the uh, responses, you can, rec you can recover the um, original data. Um, number two is, um, is that like basically- So that like makes the proof a little bit smaller? And number two, it makes the proof smaller. Number three, it makes the proof much lighter to verify. And number four, it like gets to be pure, kind of like uh, purely hash based. So there's like much less, uh, like which just makes it more possible to set the protocol in stone, in stone and not worry about changing it later. The proof's expensive. The proof's expensive to verify anyway, because you gotta have the data. Mm, right, but the yeah, but like it's still the case that you have a yeah. So okay, from a computation time perspective, hashes are incredibly cheap. But well, you don't need the data to verify the proof. You just need the Merkle root and some Merkle branches, right? No, the Merkle. By, I think by by data he means Merkle branches. Okay. Um, yeah. So I, I mean, I guess like you might get a factor of like two savings on the size of the proof. I'm, I'm not sure. Agree. Uh, yeah. No, so from a data point of view, not much. From a computation point, a huge amount. 
So what's the disincentive again for revealing S to like an outsourcer or something like that? You said it was disincentivized. But yeah, it... okay, so first of all, the outsourcer can submit S ahead of time and basically claim your money. Now, if you, will, if you have a model where you're outsourcing to kind of partially trusted outsourcers that have reputations and so they won't do that, then we could introduce another kind of game which is basically a kind of deniable challenge. So the idea basically is that we um, allow anyone to kind of gamble on like properties of your future revealed as to some extent. And like basically to the extent to which anyone has more than 50% certainty about like some, pro about some property of your seed, then um, they, would be, they would be able to earn money off of this and they would be like basically, in this, it would be totally unknown who did this. They could do this with a totally unknown account and it would be um, indistinguishable from someone you know, like just do, doing it for fun. Can you get around, can you get around the first? Uh bonded smart contract and you, you burn Yeah, you totally agree. You get around the first issue with a bonded smart contract. You, you, like, you can do a bonded smart contract. You can do, um, uh, you can just use your reputation. Mm -hmm. Hello, I remember the, um, you know, in Trubit, for example, they, um, at some point, they've introduced like a special, so in order to incentivize people checking, mm -hmm. they've introduced a special game where it does, the cheating does actually happen. Uh, yeah, do you have that in there as well? Or um, not yet, but it could be added. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. On average, how many uh, of these do you expect? Um, like a node to validator to have to. You mean compute. how many uh, challenges? Uh, no, just like. Oh. Um, on average, they receive the actual data a month later, and they want to compute if it's and they. No, so suspect. the compu the computation is very trivial. Like you're basically for one megabyte, you're essentially hashing over uh, two megabytes of data. Okay. Or sorry, you're you're x overing over a megabyte and then hashing over two megabytes. So you expect them to do it for? You like, just expect like totally random nodes to just do it. We could even shove it into the default software. It's very trivial. Okay. Hmm. Let's see. Um. I think we. We mean like the the public key based thing or something else? No, just taking the one, the first bit. Oh, so oh right, yes. So one advantage of the uh, proof only being uh, one bit is basically that for the purpose of BLS aggregation, if you remember like BLS. BLS signatures, you can do them for multiple messages and multiple users, but for every user you're adding, you're only adding an elliptic curve addition of overhead, but for every message, you're adding an extra elliptic curve pairing of overhead. And so for efficiency, you want the number of messages that people are signing over to be extremely small. And also for information theoretic reasons, you want it to be extremely small because like if, we, if every single attester includes a separate proof of custody, then we're going, we're going from one bit per validator to 256 bits per validator. So with this model, like basically there are only two possible proof of custody claims that any particular validator could use. Yes. So if you're using this BLS aggregation and mm -hmm. you're... If you're using this BLS aggregation and you're also a proposer, could you potentially equivocate uh, by like using one signature for like your aggregated total and using another one to, to reveal um, to the network? No, because like the idea is that the way that you would sign is you would basically like whatever the signature is, say of the previous block, if you want to claim a zero, you would just sign over that plus zero, and then if you want to claim a one, you would sign over that hash plus one. Okay. I have to think about it, but Yeah. And then like obviously we'd have to have two different bid fields for the zero signers and for the one signers.